Okay, so welcome here. Um, the next talk here in the main hall of the DEPCONF 2018 in Taiwan. Um, we're having now here uh, Bidel Garbi and Keith Packett next to me. They will talk about uh, rockets. So, of course, we're here at DEPCONF, so it's all about freedom and uh, uh, flying rockets with free hardware and free software. I just heard some exciting uh, background information here. You already started uh, the company 2010, but you have been working already for several years before that together. So looking forward to hear more about the details of flying rockets here with DBN free hardware and free software. Thank you very much for joining us. Great. Thank you. Can everybody hear us okay? Can you hear me as well? Yes. Good levels? Awesome. Perfect. So, um, for those of you who've been to Debian uh, conferences before, this is not the first time Keith or I have given a talk about rocket-related things. We're actually going to try and do something a little bit different today. Um, we will be talking about our passion and uh, sort of shared obsession. We're two grown men with a shared chemical obsession with ammonium perchlorate composite propellants. Um, but we will not just talk about sort of the what we do part, but we're going to talk about all the tools that we use for doing the various things that are related to both our rocketry hobby and our rocket electronics business that come from Debian and talk about the places along the way where the work that we've done has motivated us to make additional contributions to Debian. And so um, don't be fooled, this is very much a Debian all the time for everything we do kind of talk. Um, so what is this whole, what, what's the whole sort of context about this? I guess before that, uh, out of curiosity, how many of you have never heard us give a rocket talk before? Awesome, awesome. There are some people that are getting this abuse for the first time, perfect. Um, so when we talk about rockets, we're not talking about, you know, big commercial rockets. We're talking about rockets that we use in our hobby. This is an interesting collection of small rockets. Um, we have <coughs> bigger rockets, some of which you'll see photos later. Um, and <coughs> the objective here is sort of a combination of um, sort of science and engineering and sort of a technical hobby. Um, and also, it's just a heck of a lot of fun to go out in the middle of nowhere, very far away from people um, and put rockets up in the air and just fly them and have a good time. Um, to give you a sense of scale, um, of these rockets, the largest one, which has the red nose and the yellow fin can, that's about a 100 millimeter diameter tube that's a meter and a third or a meter and a half long. Um, I have built rockets that were as much as three meters long, and I'm working on one right now that will be closer to four meters long and about 350 millimeters in diameter. Um, I personally have uh, had rockets go faster than Mach 3 and to altitudes above, well, let's see. I don't do the math very well in my head, so 32,000 feet. About 10 kilometers. A little over 10 kilometers, yep. yep. Um, just to give you a sense of the scale of the toys that we like to play with. So, um, it doesn't take very long when you start playing around with hobby rockets before you start asking questions or trying to achieve objectives that require some kind of electronics. And so, <clears throat> Okay, what did you do to me, Keith? I did something wrong. No, you just, you just changed the way my display is set up. So let's talk just a little bit about avionics. What's the role of, yeah, put it, oh, I see what you did. You brought up the note screen, but I don't ever you use You brought up that. the note screen, it wasn't me. What did you, you changed the mode of the presenter's console. It's okay, we'll survive. <laughs> Keith and I have said several times before that um, part of the reason we uh, have so much fun working together is we have very complementary skill sets. It's also been said several times by us and other people that if we lived on the same street in the same town in the same part of the country, we'd, we would probably have been forced to kill each other by now. So um, <clears throat> the best kind of partnership. So the role of avionics is sort of, uh, there's sort of two big things that matter. One is to fly the rocket safely and hopefully be able to get it back so that you can fly it again. 
And the second part is to collect information about what's happened during the flight. Um, sometimes that's so that you can design a better rocket for next time. Sometimes you're in a competition and you're trying to compare your results with other people. Um, but one of the aspects that um, we've pursued quite a bit is that all of our um, electronic systems that Keith and I ourselves use routinely uh, also have uh, GPS receivers and radio links back to the ground so that we're getting live telemetry during the flight um, and are able to go find our rockets um, after we're done flying them. And one of the things that happened uh, very early in my personal involvement in the rocketry hobby is that a rather large project that I built got lost. And it got lost because of a bug in the firmware of a commercial flight computer that I was using to control the deployment of the parachutes in that flight. And that was really, really frustrating. And so um, it led me uh, to be very, very interested in trying to develop um, uh, something that worked better and that was open because, of course, that particular product was proprietary and there was no way for me to do anything about it. Um, so today there are a number of uh, boards that Keith and I have designed and built and use in our own rocket uh, projects, but which we also make available to others in the rocketry hobby through a company called Altus Metrum. We're actually really proud of ourselves that Altus Metrum uh, has met all of our original business objectives, which were... Let's see. Uh, stay friends. Yep. Have fun. Yep. Don't lose too much money. Yes. In fact, we have succeeded so well in the not losing too much money that we were really tickled that we could afford to become sponsors of DevConf this year for the first time. Really small sponsors. You have to look on the website to find our logo. It's not on the t-shirts and all, but we thought that was really cool. Um, hopefully by the time we're done talking today, you'll see that the contributions that we're making to Debian because of this work are a whole lot more than just money, though. Um, in any case, we have a number of different products that we make. They kind of break down into boards that go inside rockets that are mostly flight computers for safely triggering events related to the deployment of parachutes and the recovery of those rockets after they've flown. Um, and also for collecting data about the flight and sending position and uh, uh, flight dynamic information back over radio links during flight uh, and making it possible for us to go find them other after the flight. Uh, that also requires, of course, that we have um, ground station hardware so that we can receive the radio telemetry during flight and do something interesting with it. Um, today, the most interesting one of those products we make receives our radio link and turns it into a Bluetooth connection so that you can watch the flight information live using a cell phone or a tablet. Um, and the most interesting thing in that space that's happened recently that's something we didn't actually do is there's now a third party company making an application in the Apple App Store for iOS users um, because, of course, none of the code that Keith and I write, all of which is, of course, under the GPL, um, is welcome in the Apple App Store. So, <clears throat> um, the kinds of things we make. So, this is the, uh, the kind of the first thing that we built was a two-channel flight computer called Telemetrum. Um, you can see on the, in the top image it has a, uh, a GPS patch antenna and a beeper, and in the bottom image you can actually see the GPS receiver, the U-blocks part, along with the STM microcontroller, the large chip in the center. A memory chip, an accelerometer, a barometric sensor, and a radio transceiver. Um, and for a sense of scale, that board's about 25 by 75 millimeters. Yep. And then we also have, this is our first ground station. This is a USB connected ground station. Uh, it's got an SMA connector, a little radio receiver, um, and, the, and, the, and the, the holes on the right side of the board are where you connect a USB wire. Here's our, here's our bigger flight computer. It's got uh, more, more, uh, flight chan uh, more channels of, uh, of pyro channel, uh, uh, things to in initiate stuff during flight. Um, it's also got a three-axis accelerometer, a three-axis gyroscope, and a three-axis magnetometer, which lets us track the orientation of the rocket in flight, uh, which is really useful if you want to know, if you want to uh, inhibit uh, various events uh, should the rocket tilt over and point at you. Um, that's been very useful in, in making rocketry safer. 
Um, this is one of the things where uh, a little bit of electronics and a little bit of uh, computing know-how goes a long ways in actually making the, the hobby that we enjoy safer for people to participate in, uh, which we both like to, like to do. Particularly for complex projects, either multi-stage rockets where you're lighting additional rocket motor stages in flight, or for something we call air starts, where it's a single-stage rocket, but the motors don't all light at the same time. You have one motor that lights, and as it's burning, you light additional motors, and all of those sorts of things that we call complex flights are made substantially safer by the ability to gate uh, pyrotechnic events based on things like how many degrees you are away from vertical and stuff like that. And then we also make some without radios. Uh, some people put these electronics inside of uh, RF opaque uh, containers, uh, carbon fiber or other metallized uh, and aluminum. conductive systems, aluminum. Um, and so we make our electronics without radios. So BDL and I are really careful to never do that because the radio is the most interesting part of it to us. Um, it means you can track the rocket, um, and it also means that when the rocket uh, ends up six or seven feet under the ground, uh, crushed into a pulp, uh, having failed to uh, correctly deploy the, uh, the uh, parachutes, um, you still get data from the flight. Um, and data from the flight is the most important thing that we get out of uh, rocketry because if you go, don't get data, you have no idea what went wrong. Yeah, on my first successful attempt at exceeding Mach 3 without having the airframe come Partially apart. Partially successful. It was a successful, a successful attempt to do Mach 3 without having the airframe come apart. Unfortunately, the remains of the airframe ended up about a half a meter below ground. So, <laughs> <coughs> yeah, a little problem with the aperture deployment. We'll be uh, attempting a, a retry on that particular project, uh, hopefully uh, right at the end of August at a launch out in southeastern Kansas. I mean, and it, it penetrated dirt hard enough that we had to try, we had to, in order to find the the back end of the rocket, which was closest to the surface of the ground, we had to use a pickaxe. So this rocket is the, bo the, 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 the bottom of the rocket, the back end of the rocket is more than a half a meter below ground, and the ground is too hard for us to dig. It was a pointy stick about 75 millimeters in diameter with you know, a pointed nose cone with a metal tip on it uh, coming down at Close point, to Mach 1. Point, point 0.78 of Mach or something yeah. like that. So yeah, it made an interesting, we, when we found it, it was a cute little hole with three slots. <laughs> Where the fins cut the dirt. Yeah. yeah. And without telemetry and GPS, we wouldn't have even known where to look because yep. after the motor burned out and the smoke trail stopped, we had no visible sightings on the airframe as it went up above 10 kilometers and came back down, so. Yeah, there's the back of that board. Here's a, just a GPS receiver. So this is just a tracker. Uh, you could put this on your dog or your, um, <laughs> or your business partner um, and <laughs> allow you to track them around uh, anywhere on the planet. Uh, it's a little GPS receiver and, and uh, trans. So this is kind of the other half of that, uh, the other half of the board. Yeah, a lot of folks will take one of these and stuff it up inside of a, a fiberglass nose cone or something that's RF transparent so that it can get GPS signals and send telemetry out and they'll have one of our flight control boards buried down in the fin can, either in the middle of a pile of aluminum parts or sometimes carbon fiber assemblies that are this, RF opaque. And this one's about one inch by one and a half inches or 25 by 40 millimeters or so. Yep. Nice and tiny. Okay. Okay, so that's the kind of products that we make. What is it that we actually do with these? Well. Uh, not surprisingly, Keith and I got into this because we like to build rockets. And in the process of building rockets, there's various bits of software that come into play. Um, probably the most um, frequently used tool for us for this these days is this thing called Open Rocket. Uh, this started out as a master's thesis by a student, I think, in Finland, um, who ended up uh, basically writing a huge pile of Java that uh, implements a design capture and simulation tool for hobby rockets. Um, there were a couple things that were really interesting about it um, relative to the other things that were available for Windows and so forth at the time. Uh, first of all, um, he chose to put it under an open source license, which was awesome. Um, the second thing is that because the team at his university that he was supporting with this work uh, were flying big honking rockets that went really fast up high, he got interested in solving some problems having to do with how drag uh, varies across the transonic boundary that uh, nobody in the sort of 
software for Windows for people playing with toy rockets had bothered dealing with before. There's still six or maybe a few more active contributors. Um, it's been now quite some time since there was a new upstream stable release, but watching the develop list, I think there'll be one coming maybe before the end of the calendar year. Um, because it's one of those classic huge piles of Java with lots of weird dependencies and all sorts of things incorporated in the source tree that I just haven't had the patience to successfully unravel for a while, um, I don't actually, we don't actually do that as a full package in Debian, but there's an installer package that makes it really easy for people who want to use this to uh, download and maintain and sort of stay up to date on the current version of the pre-built jar that's up on their site. Um, <clears throat> if anybody's enthusiastic about wanting to tackle uh, this and uh, is interested in unraveling some of the Java build dependencies in it and working on it with me, uh, I'd be totally happy, uh, particularly now that I'm retired and in theory have a little more time, um, it would be cool to see this turn back into a real Debian package that, you know, uh, could live in Maine. Um, and then we use uh, various tools for designing the different mechanical pieces in the rocket. Um, we use OpenSCAD a lot because it's really easy for uh, creating things like uh, centering rings. I'll show you an example in a second. Um, and FreeCAD is, is pretty handy for doing more complex mechanical assemblies and, and thinking about how pieces are going to fit together. Uh, the good news there is other people maintain those for Debian and the packages just work great. So. Here's sort of a screenshot of what open rocket looks like when you're designing a rocket. As you can see at the top, there's sort of a hierarchical view of the components that go into building the airframe. And for each of those components, you can open that up and there's lots of data in there about what's the material that it's composed of, uh, what, if it's an exterior uh, component, what's its uh, coefficient of drag or the surface fineness associated with that. And you know, it's really pretty easy to sit there and kind of chunk pieces together and, and come up with an idea for a new rocket. And then the simulation element of this is really pretty accurate. Um, I've had results that were within a few tens of meters on flights that were to several kilometers above ground, uh, even with uh, motors that I had designed myself. And getting all the way from a propellant formula all the way through to a flight simulation and having it come out you know, within a couple hundred feet or you know, some tens of meters was kind of mind-boggling. Um, <clears throat> OpenSCAD, you know, you've all probably, if, if you do any sort of mechanical or 3D printing stuff, this tool might be familiar with to you. Uh, that's an example of a centering ring. Uh, my son and I were designing for a complex project that had a large center motor and a ring of smaller motors around it. Um, and so this is designed to hold those motor mount tubes in a fixed position inside the airframe tube. Um, and then, you know, <coughs> we have a CNC router in the house, so we'll go check up a piece of Baltic birch plywood and uh, turn those designs into physical parts. And uh, here's a nose cone that was being uh, machined on our CNC milling machine in the garage out of a rather large chunk of maple. Um, <coughs> and that's the rocket that my son designed from scratch and built all the parts for. It's a half-scale uh, model of a U.S. Maverick missile. Um, unfortunately, on its first flight, uh, he had an Apogee uh, deployment failure, so it ended up, uh, the flight was a whole lot more like a real Maverick flight than he had intended. Uh, this is another example where um, I think the brown band near the aft end of the rocket was just below ground level and only a little bit of the aft fins were sticking up. But, you know, things happen. Um, <coughs> you know, what can we say? Um, the other thing that I've gotten really interested in over the last two or three years, uh, most people who play with hobby rockets do it using commercially available um, propellant reload kits. In other words, the motors they're flying were designed and the propellant was uh, crafted into uh, kits of propellant and the related pieces by somebody else. But playing around with the chemistry and physics involved in uh, rocket motors is something that I got kind of interested in. It's almost an entire hobby unto itself. Um, but one of the side effects of that is I got really interested in rocket motor simulation software. This is actually simulating the combustion of the propellant and uh, all of the things that are related to the motor generating thrust. Um, and I'm really pleased to be able to report that there's not one, but a couple of different motor simulation programs and due in part at least to needling from Keith and or me of the respective authors. Um, one program which is written in C and this other one which is written in Java um, are now both available under the GPL. 
And uh, unfortunately, neither one is packaged in Debian yet. Uh, this is again one of those examples of my Java foo is not good enough to get this to build because it has a dependency on something that the Java community really doesn't use anymore and I haven't figured it out yet. Um, but eventually I will probably make time to put this in Debian. But in the meantime, uh, here's an example of an actual motor that I designed and flew with it. This was a four grains of propellant in a 54 millimeter diameter motor. Um, and as you can see, there's, you know, sort of simulation run showing what the thrust and chamber pressure and all that are going to be. And then here are the four grains in the casting stands in my garage after I mixed up the propellant and sort of turned it into the right grains. And then, of course, you know, before you entrust a rocket to it, uh, a friend and I designed and built this test stand, <coughs> which allows us to put a motor in upside down and uh, burn it using the earth as a... Um, a, uh, a mass to push against, um, and built into that stand are sensors for measuring the thrust. There's a load cell in there, and uh, for measuring the chamber pressure. And of course, that led me to design a circuit board full of electronics so that I have a wireless interface to my test stand, so I don't have to sit out in the sun real close to a dangerous motor while we're testing it to collect the data. Uh, this little board, uh, it's now typically used in a better package, but it allows us to successfully start, um, operate the test stand, collect all the data, and then download that data over the air and uh, analyze the motor performance before uh, we have to go out in the sun and deal with the remains of the, of the burn. So with that, you want to talk a little bit about? Yeah, so the other, part, the other thing, you've seen us uh, doing a whole lot of uh, the uh, circuit boards. Uh, we need, uh, obviously, we need uh, computer tools in order to design the circuit boards, design the circuits and the circuit boards and have them fabricated. Um, so we use the GEDA suite of applications for all of our circuit board design. This is kind of one of those big schisms in the, it's the VI versus Emacs of the, GE, of the EDA world. Yep. You can either use GEDA or you can use um, KeyCAD. KeyCAD. Um, <clears throat> and the funny thing is, BDI and I both use Emacs pretty extensively with a little bit of VI on the side. But GEDA is a lot more like Vim. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a bunch of little tools all kind of vaguely glued together. Uh, whereas KeyCAD is this enormous suite that does everything, including reading your email. Um, and so there's a schematic uh, capture tool, uh, GSCIM. There's the PCB editing uh, tool called PCB. Um, and then you can actually view the files, uh, view the files that you generated before you send them off to be manufactured. So this is literally the ability to, to generate a circuit, generate a circuit board, have files you upload to some website, um, and in a couple of days you get physical, physical boards back that you can load by yourself. Um, it's pretty cool. Um, there's a bunch of companies around uh, the world that, that uh, do this uh, uh, Gerber to uh, PC board fabrication. Um, um, I'm sure there's some uh, here in Taiwan. I know in, in, in my town of Portland, there's Osh Park which offers a, a very expensive service. So this is a way for anybody to build whatever electronics they want, uh, not requiring the ability to manufacture PC boards. Um, right now, there's a big, a big uh, transition happening in the, in the GEDA world. Um, a lot of people um, have, a lot of developers have moved from, from the kind of moribund PCB project to this more active PCB R&D project. Um, it's got a lot of new capabilities that we're excited to use, including uh, a better ability to have uh, kind of modern parts um, and parts with more features. Um, and it allows us to generate a 3D model and actually export a 3D model of our, of our boards to customers. We regularly get customers. I had a cust uh, question this morning, how thick is the board with all the components on it? I have no idea. You know, I would have to have models of all the little parts and measure them by hand. With having a, a 3D model, I could just go into the 3D model and look at it. Uh, BDL, so, yeah. so an interesting example here, though, is that um, in the KeyCAD side, um, there recently has been an additional capability added to export designs into FreeCAD, and that's pretty cool, but FreeCAD's another really huge piece of software. What the PCB R&D upstream developer talked about, which Keith and I then agreed actually as Altus Metrum to provide some uh, sponsorship for, is that he generated a, an exporter that outputs an OpenSCAD source file, a SCAD file. So it's a really lightweight representation that's easy to turn into a 3D STL model, yep. um, which is what most of our customers actually want. And um, it's a whole lot lighter weight, and it's something we can use as a make target instead of another huge piece of software we have to deal with. And these are all, uh, BDL actually maintains all of these uh, uh, programs along with the, uh, the rest of the Debian Electronics team. Uh, so we are making sure that the tooling that we depend upon 
is current and updated in Debian so that everybody can take advantage of it. It's one of the things we agreed to when we first started, and it's part of um, actually having fun and sort of staying true to what each of us really think about life and what some of our core values are. We just absolutely insist that every tool we use for designing and selling our products is something that we can use Debian to, to do. Yep. It is the universal operating system, except it's not flying into my rockets yet. Next project. Yeah, we keep talking about we should do a board for a rocket that's powerful enough to actually run Debian on it, but it's such a waste of silicon. Um, here's, here's what G-Scan looks like. <coughs> it's a typical schematic capture program. You basically draw your circuit using lines and components. Um, and these, these components actually have attributes that say what they look like on the circuit board. Um, and the schematic, cap the schematic capture generates files that are then imported into the PCB tool. Um, and as you edit the schematic, you can re-export that and re-import it into the PCB tool and, and keep the two in sync. Yep. There's, there's a bunch of design rule checking to make sure that when you build your circuit board, it actually matches the circuit, which is kind of cool. Um, and so you actually have some validation that the circuit board you generate is going gonna, is gonna to accurately implement the circuit that you've designed. And that's kind of the whole notion of schematic capture and PCB design. Uh, here's what PCB looks like. It's, a, it's basically a graphics editor. You draw copper and you, and you uh, paint uh, components onto the board. Um, it's, kind of the, it's kind of the MS Paint of the, of the, uh, of the, of the system where you're you know, kind of in there drawing individual pixels practically. Um, it looks, when you first start it up, you're like, well, how do I use this tool? It's a big blank window with nothing in it. And you're like, oh, I import, import my schematic objects, which each have a graphical representation, and then you just kind of move them around and draw lines between the two that represent the copper. <laughs> yeah, um, so this is one of those places where art and science commingle a bit, and um, I'm really thrilled that, that Keith has ended up um, having fun designing a whole bunch of circuit boards, and in fact, some of the products that we shipped today, Keith did the hardware designs on, um, but let me tell you, when you're trying to build boards that are about yay big and have multiple radios that are all single digit millimeters apart from each other, it's a little more than just moving parts around and drawing lines. Um, making things that actually work is, is where it gets really fun sometimes. And that's why it's awesome to have BDL around so that when I screw up the radio, BDL can tell me what I did wrong. Or just fix it. <laughs> or just fix it. Well, yeah, yeah. Whichever. You can see, this, here we are actually making, uh, making a, a product by hand. Uh, we don't actually make our, manufacture our products by hand uh, very often because that's really though. tedious. But, so this is a prototyping step where we got, some, uh, got a, a PCB manufacturing company to give us half a dozen boards. Uh, we've, uh, we've used a, uh, use, this is actually when we were using some uh, laser cut uh, Captan uh, stencils. And so we actually had another company uh, laser cut the little holes where the solder needed to go. And then you squeegee this solder paste, which is a mixture of, uh, of flux and tiny little beads of solder. You squeegee that over the board, take it off, and then you've got solder all the places the components need to go. Um, and then use, uh, use a, an inspection microscope to stick the components on. The components are tiny. Uh, so a typical resistor is, uh, is uh, an 0402. Um, that's 40 by 20 hundredths, 40 by 20 thousandths of an inch. Uh, so the, the components are tiny and we end. Which is one, by, one millimeter by half millimeter or something, something like, like that. that. Yeah. We don't remember anymore. I think a 0402 metric equivalent is a 1005, yeah, so I think like it's that. a one millimeter by a half millimeter. Anyway, they're frickin' small and hard to see. And, and we are both old men, and uh, <coughs> we need microscopes to be, yeah. able to, see it, to be able to assemble our circuit boards. So that's all it takes, so it takes a microscope and a... Uh, and a tweezers. A, a tweezers uh, to do electronics these days. Then when you've got it all assembled, you stick it in a, you stick it in a frying pan and cook it for a while uh, with a very carefully calibrated uh, cooking profile and, and the solder all melts and the components are all put together and that's how you build it like I was actually pleased on the industry tour the other day um, one of the example objects that we saw in the Science Park Museum was one of the non-contact infrared thermometers and it happens to be the exact model that I use for calibrating that <laughs> frying pan so yeah. that was really very amusing yep you doing the t software or am I doing the software you're doing software I'm doing software you're, okay you you wrote most wrote of it I wrote almost all the software. So in the spirit of uh, the division of labor, uh, BDL does the hardware and I do the software. <laughs> and then I end up packing most of the boxes to ship things. So. And yeah, and then BDL ends up debugging my software as well. Um, and I, I end up getting to do some of the hardware and packing very little hard, very little for shipping. In any case, um, because of, uh, so we're writing stuff for, at this point, almost entirely our microcontrollers. Um, they are a lot of fun. They're inexpensive, amazingly powerful, um, and very low power. 
Um, and as a result, uh, we're using an embedded language, our, my, my least favorite, most favorite. Yeah, it's a love-hate relationship with the C language. Um, of course, um, all of the source code is available on our Git repository. Uh, because we're using uh, our microcontrollers, the, the tool chain for these uh, microcontrollers actually lets you do source level debugging right on the target. Um, and this is an amazing revelation to those of us who grew up in the 70s, uh, where debugging was a painful experience uh, in systems that didn't have a display. Um, so we have full source, level, full source level debugging with GDB and breakpoints and inspecting of memory and all kinds of cool stuff. Um, the, uh, I wrote a little operating system because everybody should write an operating system, right? Even I've written one, we just wouldn't use it. Exactly. Um, which was fun, right? I mean, I could have just gone off and used some existing real-time operating system and it would have been like, okay. Well, you did do that for a while, but the one we were trying to use was just huge and clunky and did lots of things we didn't want and none of the things we actually wanted. And besides, here's an opportunity to, to meet our, one of our primary business objectives. Have fun. That's right. <clears throat> I, yeah. writing, writing operating systems, that's a blast. Uh, so it's a little cooperative multitasker. It could do preemptive multitasking, but meh, I don't need it. Why bother? It's harder. Um, and so we, and, and that, all the tasks in that, some of them do logging, some of them do radio, some of them run the beeper, some of them do the pyro charges. And so there's a whole bunch of tiny little tasks. And it's kind of amazing that pe when people use our boards and they, they, they can't figure out why the, the beeping and the radio telemetry and everything is kind of out of sync with each other. And it's like, well, it's, you know, whenever the tasks get run, things happen. They're like, well, in other boards, things kind of happen in lockstep in a more traditional embedded design. But processes are fun. Um, all of our devices use USB, uh, which makes it possible to connect them to almost anything. Um, they all have a little command line in them because that way you can debug stuff without needing any host, uh, host software. Um, and so if you plug our boards into your computer, and uh, Chaos Key is uh, no, no, uh, no uh, different here. When you plug Chaos Key in debug mode, uh, in uh, reflash mode, it actually has a little command line interpreter that you talk to to reflash it. Um, here's, here's the compiler suite that we used to use, uh, the SDCC. Um, we had an adventure with SDCC, a new version came out. Um, and the binaries that it generated wouldn't fit in our products anymore. They got bigger. They got, it's, it's an embedded device. Life is short and the ROM is full. And we looked at what they'd done and it made really good sense. And we totally agreed they'd done the right thing. But unfortunately, it made all of our firmware overflow the size of the flash memories and the processors we were using. And we looked at each other and thought about it for a long time. And Keith basically said, it's going to be no fun trying to fix this. And I said, OK, we'll fork the compiler. We um, love free software. What a, we could what fork a frickin' it. disaster. But um, that's why there's a package called CC1111 in the archive. The processor chip we um, were using at the time was the uh, TI Chipcon CC1111. And CC being C compiler, I love the double entendre. So that's what it's been called. Uh, we actually have a plan for doing away with support for all of the ancient to us now 8051 devices Ooh. after our next um, release of our uh, software system which will be coming probably in a, in a week or two. So we are maybe single digit weeks away from uh, obsoleting support for that processor in our source tree. And as soon as we do that, that package will be disappearing from the archive. I strongly suggest that anybody who wants to do 8051 development, uh, first of all, check yourself in somewhere and find out why. <coughs> um, <laughs> But um, if you are, then please use the current SDCC and don't build a dependency on CC1111, or you may have the pleasure of adopting that package and taking it over when I have it removed from the archive, hopefully in a few weeks from now. The other, the other compiler that we use, of course, is GCC for our ARM stuff. Uh, when we started, there wasn't, uh, there wasn't an embedded ARM compiler for the chips that we're using in the Debian archive. Um, there's a lot of ideas on how to, how, how to build that, what, what you would build and what it would look like. Um, and I went ahead and packaged that um, and got it into the archive. And then about a week later, uh, some helpful person came along and decided that they wanted to do a better job of packaging it and took it over. And I'm like, woohoo! hoo um, so, so yes, so, so we were able to just, you know, kind of see this whole developed, uh, embedded ARM development environment uh, in Debian, which was cool. Um, the other tools that we use, of course, are the, uh, the debug connector tools for that source level debugging. The one that we use right now is OpenOCD. Uh, um, Noodles packages that for us, has updated the packages for that, and it's been awesome. It works great. Um, and we actually uh, are using an ARM chip now that has a support for the DFU uh, uh, device firmware update, I think is what that stands it's for. It's a built-in 
really small USB flashing tool that you can use to do your first flash of firmware on a brand new device from the factory. And so that tool is actually in the archive. I was shocked. It's like, okay, I've got this chip. It's got this bizarre custom protocol. I'm sure I'm going to have to go write some new tool. And I do an app search, and there it is. And I install, and it just works. It's a twisted little tool, but it actually works. And we use it exactly once per product to put our bootloader on it. And yep. then after that, we're sort of in control, which is what free software is all about. Yep. Uh, so. Embedded devices need a C library. You want strings functions, you want to be able to have a math library, and you want a little bit of standard I.O. for debugging. Um, SDCC and GCC AVR, those are the kind of the two 8-bit uh, uh, embedded compilers in, in Debian right now, they have their own C library. It's awesome. You, you install the compiler, and you can just compile stuff, and you have a C library. Uh, GCC ARM None ABI, the embedded compiler we use for ARM, suggests that you use Newlib Nano, but Newlib Nano isn't actually an embedded C compiler. It's, it's not actually very nano. Yeah, it's, it's kind of huge. And, the, and in particular, the standard I.O. that it uses uh, requires about 20 or 30 POSIX operating system functions, like open, close, read, write. It's like, I ain't got that. I got put C, get C. That's all we have. Um, so we're trying to figure out what to do for embedded uh, C, uh, uh, C libraries um, for really tiny systems. Um, I have a hack right now that I'm playing with. It's the new lib nano uh, library with the, the, uh, the studded I.O. bits from GCC AVR. It kind of works. Um, we're going to be playing with that. If you are building uh, embedded systems with ARM chips in it and you don't want all of the complexity of the standard I.O. from new lib nano, um, I would love to collaborate. Uh, right now I'm collaborating with Noodles to try to get uh, his Extensa uh, chip to use this same library um, if you have other embedded systems. I would like to get to the point where we have kind of a standard embedded uh, C library for tiny systems that's available in the archive. Yeah, and so the, the unfortunate reality is that um, not all of the people in the world, and particularly not all of the folks who want to buy and use our hardware, um, actually run Debian yet. Um, so we, uh, Keith in particular, has spent time having to sort of unravel what it would take to build software for the OS disadvantage. And the really amazing thing for us is that all of the bits and pieces required um, to build uh, packages for Windows, for Mac OS X, for Android, um, they all are already around in Debian. And so we actually have a single source tree with a fairly complex set <coughs> of uh, make file uh, targets uh, that allows me to do a software release with really pretty, pretty close to one top level make command if everything goes well. Um, and emit, you know, this huge pile of different installer objects that we can just stump out on our website and people can grab and download. And, uh, you know, once again, it's just amazing to us that Debian has all the tools required to do this. So it really is possible to use Debian as your software development platform and deliver uh, working installer packages that install applications people can run on, you know, this in sort of bizarre range of, of operating systems. Non-Debian systems. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> we've mentioned a couple times the whole business thing, and, and I, I tell people that you know we don't just use um, free software for designing our products and, and, and designing our rockets, but we're actually uh, running the business entirely using free software as well. Uh, for the web storefront that we use um, to actually sell things at shop.gag.com, uh, we're running Magento which is an amazingly huge, complex, really feature-filled uh, PHP-based web store implementation. It is all um, completely open source. Um, there are the usual issues with big web suites of, you know, it wants to hand out minified JavaScript and things like that. Um, but <coughs> um, it has been, uh, while it was challenging to figure out initially, it has run really, really well. Um, and that's been very successful for us. It's not packaged for Debian, and honestly, I don't know if a pile of PHP that big ever really makes sense to you know, package in Debian. Um, one of the things that's happened between uh, Magento V1 and V2, which I'm in the process of moving to, is they've completely restructured the source, and they have their own sort of dependency management tool for uh, building and, and maintaining and updating the software. Um, so while it's not packaged for Debian, we're running it on Debian, and one of the things I'll be publishing as soon as I put um, our V2 store in production is a cookbook explaining all the sort of steps I went through 
Uh, there are, in particular, for people like me who don't do web things all the time, some interesting little gaps in the knowledge that's out there about, I think the last thing was one more patchy module that without it, nothing seemed to work the way you expected, and with it, all of a sudden, it's all working. So I'm going to try and publish the notes about that when I can. Um, and then we chose, uh, after you know, messing around for a while and sort of doing what you do when you first start things and using the things like our the US Postal Services website for, for initiating packages and, and, and shipping stuff, um, I kind of gave up. I found a, a third party software as a service offering called ShipStation. And frankly, um, if you run a small business and need to ship a lot of stuff, um, I think they're a global concern, but certainly in the US. Uh, it's well worth the small amount of money that we're paying per month to have access to that because the productivity of it is really amazing. It hooks into the back end of the web store. It learns about new orders and helps me manage uh, sort of where we are in the process of fulfilling those orders. And um, the discounts we get because they have so many customers and are generating so many shipping labels with all the different shipping carriers um, actually almost entirely offset the cost of, of paying for that service. Um, and then the other big thing that you have to do when you're running business is you have to you know, do accounting stuff. And um, shockingly, um, Ledger-CLI, which is now getting sort of long in the tooth and there are other things that people are working on as sort of replacements and alternatives that um, you can find out about if you want to go read about them. Um, it actually is completely for su sufficient for my needs at the moment, though. And I really like having an accounting system where the journal is something I can whack on in Emacs with um, a little bit of an Emacs mode that provides some macro assistance. Um, and <clears throat> once again, this is something that's already packaged in Debian. It works just great. Um, and because all the data is stored in things that look like text files, it's easy to keep your accounting history in Git and to never be surprised um, if all of a sudden <coughs> the numbers don't line up, you can have some way to unravel that. In order to get data into Ledger CLI, um, I use the beanbag tool that Anthony Towns and others uh, created for uh, sort of making it easy to write code in Python that interacts with REST APIs. And with uh, AJ's help, I figured out how to do that the first time, and now I have a ever-growing and complexity script that pulls sales transaction data out of the store and turns it into uh, transaction data in the accounting system. There's a tool I found called Reckon, which is kind of horrible, but <clears throat> um, it does the job that makes it easy to take CVS uh, formatted data that I'm downloading from our financial CSV, institutions. Right? Yes, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this is another one of those. I've been around too long to get the, yeah, whatever. Uh, CS comma separated value files that we download from our financial institutions, and that gives me sort of a a pattern matching thing that makes it much faster to translate those into ledger format. And then, um, you know, um, accounting is kind of like software. It's, you know, you keep your history in Git and you run make to generate all the things you need and life seems a whole lot simpler than it would be otherwise. Yeah. Just we seems we to work. everything into Git plus a make file. Yeah, that's certainly the objective. So <clears throat> um, time-wise, I know we're getting very close to the end of things, but a few minutes, great. Because um, just for fun, we have uh, some photos from various things that we've done over the years in rocketry and some of the people we got to do it with. Uh, one of the things is I remembered because we were talking at DebConf that at DebConf 10 in New York City, we actually ran a rocket building boff and uh, went out to a launch site in upstate New York on the trailing weekend and uh, spent two days playing around with the Metro Rocket Club flying rockets at their launch site. Um, uh, I don't know how many of you have ever met Mike Beatty in person. He used to be one of the members of our uh, keyring maintenance team and maintained some packages and stuff. Um, ever since he had kids, I don't think he's been all that terribly active in the Debian community, but he did show up in the U.S. and uh, came and flew uh, his level one, level two, and level three, which is what this was, high power certification flights with us at launch sites in Colorado and in Kansas a few years ago. Um, AJ also came and flew a level three high power certification project out in Kansas. That's the rocket he built to do that. Um, it literally is taller than he is. <coughs> um, and you know, this is Keith, I guess, playing with one of your tiny little rockets out in Eastern Oregon. I like to build tiny little rockets. Yeah, Keith builds tiny little rockets, which gives us test vehicles and excuses to test some of our smaller um, boards that are designed to fit in small geometry airframes. 
I'll admit I'm sort of holding down the other end of the continuum, as I mentioned <laughs> earlier, with some of my crazy big Rocket projects. Rocket geometries match our personal geometries? Yeah, more or less. Um, <clears throat> there's a photo of me that's, that's floating around where I have an airframe over my shoulder that's certainly, it was almost exactly as tall as I was and about the same diameter. Um, and uh, I'm working on one now that will be almost twice as tall as I am and bigger than me. So, uh, no, I'm not planning to ride in it. Um, <clears throat> but another thing that we did at one point is uh, my son got really interested when he was younger. Uh, he's now in the middle of a mechanical engineering uh, degree program at uh, Georgia Tech um, as an undergraduate student. Um, but a few years ago, he got really interested in uh, the heating that happens in surfaces when rockets get going really, really fast. And um, so we actually built a couple of rockets in a series. Uh, there's some photos of one of them where one of the fins had thermistors embedded in sort of a grid inside the fin. And then the nose cone had some thermistors embedded in its skin down the side. And the objective was to fly this to Mach 2 or, or faster and actually measure the temperature rise at high speed in the airframe. Um, to do that, we ended up uh, sort of customizing one of our existing flight computers and designing a board uh, that was specifically for hooking up a lot of thermistors. <coughs> and I managed to fit those in the tiny little space that was only a few millimeters thick between a rather large motor mount and a rather not much bigger airframe. Um, and that's what the airframe looked like. This is what the third, the second version of the temperature measuring project looked like. And uh, we flew that airframe uh, to Mach 2.2, .2, um, which had an interesting effect on the blue paint, which had been hastily applied in the parking lot of a hotel the night before using, you know, spray cans of paint. Uh, this is what it looked like after it had been to Mach 2.2. And uh, I, I always thought that, you know, that paint job it was substantially improved from the original, but mostly just because I thought it was really cool to see how much it had gotten peeled off. And so finally, you know, a couple of things that Keith and I have worked on that aren't really related to rockets that um, various folks know about. Um, I gave a talk at Linux Conference Australia a couple of years ago about another Altus Metrum thing, which is uh, audio boards. This is a USB uh, audio interface on one side and 30 watts per channel of Class D stereo audio amp on the other side. I took a lot of grief at the time from people about, oh, but Class D is not very hi-fi. Uh, let me tell you, these work great for all the speakers around our house, and I would challenge you to, to hear artifacts when you're wandering around a house with speakers that are mounted in ceilings and stuff like that. Um, Keith and I also have collaborated on taking some of the technology we use in our flight computers for hobby rockets, and we've turned that into a processor board for amateur radio satellites. That is an actual satellite that's about 100 millimeters on an edge. Um, that's one of several that have been launched by the Radio Amateur Satellite Corporation of America in the AMSAT um, satellite series, Oscar satellite series. Um, so there are now, I think, three of these that have one of our processor boards in yep. it that are in orbit right now, and two more that are queued up to launch, possibly by the end of this year. Uh, these all go to low Earth orbits. and. Uh, it's a real hoot that the first one of those that got launched was a circuit board that I hand assembled using my uh, tweezers and inspection microscope and frying pan in the garage of the apartment we were renting after the, the house burned down back in 2013. So very much garage shop kind of stuff going to space, which I just think is really cool. And then... And uh, probably about five or six years ago, we decided we, uh, we each had one of the little uh, random number generators for our home machines and, and couldn't get any more of them because they stopped being manufactured. Uh, so we decided to build our own, uh, came up with a noise source and came up with a little processor. And actually, I, I, I did another talk about this at LCA. The hardest part of this project was finding a box. Uh, we actually so we, talked about this at DevConf in Cape Town, too. Yeah, we did, didn't we? Uh, yep. So I have some of these for sale, if anybody wants one of these, of course. Uh, that was another fun project, of course. That all, it's another open design with all free yep. software. It's a hardware random gen number generator that you plug into a Linux machine, and kernel since 4.14 or, or so, something like that. Um, just notice it, and your entropy pool never gets empty, which is pretty cool. Um, so with that, we're pretty much ready to wrap up. Um, if you're interested in learning more, either about the tools that we're using, uh, the things we've actually designed, and so forth, you can find uh, all the details on our products at our website at altismetrum.org. 
Um, there's also some rocket-related information, including some of my airframe designs, which have been published, are out under gag.com slash rockets. Um, all the stuff we do is under free licenses. Um, we really like the GPL, and so when I was picking a hardware, a license for our hardware designs, we chose the Tapper Open Hardware License, which was intended to be and created to be a GPL-like license for hardware. Uh, it's recently been observed that there's one term in that license that um, probably triggers the uh, only use it for you know, good purposes kind of uh, issue with it not being 100% free. The um, uh, author and creator of that license has agreed to fix that for us, but it hasn't actually happened yet. And honestly, if I were starting out today, there are a couple of more recent open hardware licenses that I might use instead. Uh, the one the folks at CERN have been using seems like a really good choice. I don't personally think that um, Creative Commons licenses are great choices for hardware designs, but that's a really long conversation. Um, and uh, lots of our documentation, including a number of my rocket designs, are out there under CC by SA licenses. So um, feel free to have a look, ask questions, go out there and play. And if you happen to live in a place where hobby rocketry is legal, just do it. It's so much fun. Thanks so much. Yep, we're good. Yeah, we're good. I'm sorry we ran, ran all the way to the end of the session this afternoon. If you do have questions, uh, find us in the hallway. We'll be around for the rest of the conference. Yep.